after Hans Niemann takes the pawn, ladies and gentlemen, this is one of the most atrocious pawn structures that I have ever seen. We have tripled pawns. We have an isolated pawn. This is disgusting. Hans Niemann just got destroyed by Ray Robson. This is fresh from the US Chess Championship a couple days ago. Let's take a look, analyze this game, and understand what we can learn from it. Ray Robson with the white side opens with e4, and very quickly we have a Roy Lopez with bishop b5. But a very weird Roy Lopez begins to emerge after d3 here, a far more passive sideline. Now the idea for white is to be solid in the center, but you're not playing with the most ambitious intentions. Very soon though, after bishop c5, we have an exchange of the bishop for the knight on c6, and then white castles, develops their knight, and then strikes with d4. So on one hand, they've spent two tempo now, moving the pawn first to d3 and only then to d4, but on the other hand, they're striking in the center, they're making chaos, and they're bringing more space to their side. Okay, the game continues here with knight to d7, we have a trade in the center, a trade of knights as well, and then f4, white is expanding, and ladies and gentlemen, I think the instructive value of the game really begins right here. Because Hans Niemann plays f5 here, which is a really weird move. Now, the engines don't dislike this move, but I find it from a human perspective very, very strange. Because after queen h5, which is what was played in the game, Ray Robson provokes the move g6 and then moves the queen away. And guess what? Hans Niemann is obviously castling on that side of the board. And now, for the remainder of the game, in my opinion, the main considerations that both players are playing playing with is how can white take advantage of the weaknesses created and how can black accurately defend from those weaknesses. This idea informs and dictates the next sequence of moves that you will see, because white begins very shortly by locking up the structure with e5. What's the idea? It's to stop the bishop from being able to retreat to g7 where it will be able to cover those dark squares and those weaknesses. So what does black do? They move the bishop to c5, looking to bring it to e7, where it will be able to, to some degree, control some of those dark squares. Okay, knight b3 is played, attacking the bishop. The bishop moves, bishop e3, and now knight to c5 is played. Now the knight here on c5 is a very strong piece, controlling some very critical squares, and the knight can sit there without fear of being captured, because if black were to take the knight, guess what? those dark squares again become super telling. Without the dark square bishop for black, the position becomes really difficult practically to hold on to. So again, you can see how these dark square considerations, all because the move f5 and g6 were played, really dictate the entire course of action. Both players are very much thinking about those dark squares, and indeed, without revealing too much, the game ends up becoming untenable, and Hans Niemann ends up losing precisely because of those weaknesses. Okay, but let's see what happens. So, first of all, bishop c4, the queen moves away to safety, we have b6 kicking away the knight, but first b3, counter-attacking the bishop, and then a trade of the knight for the bishop, and now in this final position, material is completely equal, but again, white is better because of the weaknesses uh, around the king. So I feel like I'm highlighting those weaknesses again and again, but frankly, that's because they're the most important aspect of the position. Okay, so we have this move a5, a4 is played, the rook comes to the open file, we have h3, and here a very shocking move, h5. This is really, really ugly, guys. Now, I understand the point. Hans Niemann is trying to stop the move g4, but you're just creating so many extra weaknesses. Now this pawn on g6 is not only on the light squares, and therefore the dark squares are still weak, but also it's a backwards pawn. And again, without revealing too much, that becomes very important very soon. Okay, so h5 kind of unnecessary, and Hans Niemann already begins to undertake more positional weaknesses on the king side. Now, bishop to f2 is played, always keeping an eye on h4. Why? Because if this bishop ever ventures a little bit too far, this bishop is going to swoop in. Now, this ends up happening very soon. We have c4 being played, the rook is attacked, the queen comes to e1, bishop to b4, the queen comes to e2, bishop to e7, and c5. Giving away a pawn, this is a pawn sacrifice, but guess what? After Hans Niemann takes the pawn, Ladies and gentlemen, this is one of the most atrocious pawn structures that I have ever seen. Look at this, we have tripled pawns, we have an isolated pawn, we have pawns all in the same complex on the king side, leaving a lot of holes and weaknesses, 
This is disgusting. And very soon, in fact, Hans Niemann gives back the pawn to try to get a bit more breathing room for their pieces because otherwise, note that this bishop also is now being restricted by the new pawn on c5. So they give away the pawn, but that's not going to save them. Um, and unfortunately, after bishop e1, here, Hans Niemann plays a pretty fatal move, bishop to c5. Now, like I was saying, the point of the bishop on this diagonal is restricting its counterpart because if the bishop ventures too far, there we go, bishop h4. The bishop swoops into action, taking advantage and making note of the dark squares. Now, the rook is attacked, and in the game, the rook moved, but funnily enough, the best move here is actually to admit your mistake, bring the bishop back to e7, but nobody really wants to do this, at least at a human level, because you're going to be going uh, and trading the bishops off, and therefore, forever, these weaknesses will be undefendable. Okay, so instead Hans Niemann plays perhaps the human move, moving the rook away to the open file. But as you can see from the arrows, white pieces are a whole lot more active than their counterparts. The bishop on h4, the rook on the d file, very soon white doubles on the d file, and infiltration is pretty much impossible to stop. In fact, the rook very soon swoops in to the d7 square, and the game becomes resignable, more or less, because the king moves away to g8, but now the bishop comes in. Look at how much terror these pieces are causing Hans Niemann. Now, in the game, Hans Niemann played a very bad move here and then resigned on the next move because of how bad it was. It was a simple blunder. In the game, he could have resisted a little longer with king f8, setting up a pretty nasty trap. The idea is that if queen to g3 is played, trying to infiltrate uh, and using the key weaknesses that exist in the position, well then, queen takes d7 is a surprising shock, and after rook takes d7, ladies and gentlemen, it is actually black who is on the offensive, and look at this beautiful ending, rook to h1, and then bishop takes the queen on g3, and black is actually better here. So that would have been a very big turn of events, instead, rook takes f4 was played a simple blunder, because after queen to g3, it's a fork, guys. There's not much to be said. The pawn is hit on g6. That will lead to checkmate. The rook is hit on f4. If you lose the rook, you lose the game. You're losing anyways, really. Uh, the best move, just to give you some context, is rook to g4 here, just giving away the rook. Uh, but instead of that, Hans Niemann kept a little bit of his pride intact and resigned. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. Subscribe if you are new around here. Like the video if you learned something new from it. And I'll see you guys next time. Peace out.